So you go by Carrie? I do, I do. I, but I answer Carol into Carol. <laughs> you know, that's what mom always called me, right? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so yeah, sometimes, sometimes I figure that's what I should ask everybody to do. But you know, that would be a big pain at this point. <laughs> So, so Carrie, if it's okay, I'll start and okay. um, with a little introduction and okay. then um, I'll introduce you and turn the floor over to you. Okay, thank you. So who's here? I can't really tell. Uh, well, there's... Um, we have two participants at the moment. Okay. Yeah. But we had almost 40 people sign up. Great. So, there should be more coming in. Okay. Last night from my composting webinar, there was a couple who <laughs> had like a happy hour, who had wine, they were drinking wine and Whoa. <laughs> watching my composting webinar. That's not bad. Yeah, it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm ready whenever. Right, so we'll probably wait. We tend to wait. Well, now we're still early, so okay. And six thirty is the time, if you, you know. So we tend to wait like a few minutes afterwards, just you know, depending on sure. the number of people who shown up. So I might close my screen just for a second and get a glass of water. Yeah, that's what I have—a glass of water. Oh, I see. It's really quite, quite early. We still have a little while to go. All right. So you have to tell me about yourselves. Like you're, where are you? You're in Rockland, right? Yeah, I'm in Orangeburg. Okay. I'm in Putnam. Right. I'm in uh, Garrison. Oh, I love Garrison for some yeah. reason. Yeah, it's really beautiful. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I live on an old estate that, so it's pretty special. It's for sale if you want to buy it. <laughs> not from, I'm a, I rent a caretaker's cottage. So. All right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know if I'm ready to take on a big, big piece of property anymore. Yeah, it's really big. It seems it's going to, it would take a, it's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. There's, um, about 30 acres or so, and a couple of ponds, a main house, a barn with rentals, a caretaker's cottage. Wow. Yeah. And Charlie's in um, Orange. Orange. He's in, yeah, in Middletown. Middletown, right? Mm -hmm. Or Monroe, maybe Monroe. Sorry, I was just sending out a reminder. Uh, yeah, I'm in Monroe which is right over the border from Rockland. I don't know the other side of the river very well. That's what happens, right? Right, that bridge is a barrier. <laughs> yeah, it is. I do love the Bear Mountain Bridge though, because I went into work today and it is such a lovely drive. But I don't, the tap and see yellow, not so much love. <laughs> <laughs> well, traffic's a little easier now, but it's picking up. It is picking up. Like mm -hmm. I did notice, you know, if I go at more, you know, rush hour times, like the Palisades will be busy again. Yeah. Mm hmm. It's beautiful where you are in Pound Ridge. It's really, it's so pretty there. Thank you. I think it's pretty. Yeah, it's pretty special. Yeah, if you can, especially if you can sort of put blinders on when it comes to the invasive species. I know, well, that's here too. That's <laughs> unfortunately so much of the Hudson Valley. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I noticed when I have friends who have a uh, property pretty far upstate and when I go further, you know, the invasives really aren't, I mean, they're still there, but not the same. 
Uh, it, it, yeah, it really makes quite a difference. It's yeah. quite, quite amazing. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I have family in Pennsylvania and uh, it's, they, it's the, not nearly as much where they are. Yeah. Um, but you want to, I sort of like want to wake, wake them up, you know, it's like, watch out because it's yeah. coming and you'll really be sorry if you don't get yeah. it. Definitely. That's so many people from the city coming and buying property and, you know, doing it as a, you know, second home and yeah. Right. But I saw a lot of natives when I was there that I was really impressed to see. It was nice. Where was that? It's in, um, I don't know what county that is, but it's uh, Delhi area, Bovina. Okay. Yeah. But I'm not sure. What Delaware. County. Delaware County. Maybe. Delaware. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, for some reason, it's one of the spots that a lot of people from, people I know from Brooklyn ended up going up and buying property up there and starting, you know, stuff like restaurants and things like that. And high property values. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So where are we at? So we have 16, oh, but minus us four, so. 16 people? 12, 12. yeah. Okay, yeah, that's, good. That's, good. Yeah. that's good, that's <laughs> good. I found, like I was saying yesterday, that um, with all the webinars, it tends to be, you know, not all, everyone shows up. Yes, that's what I would expect, actually. Yeah. Right. People have good intentions. And mm -hmm. Right. Charlie, am I still, I'm still able to manage the chat from here. Yeah. So you'll do that, Kristen? Either one. Would you rather do that or? No, that's fine. If you want to, that would be great. Okay. You should be able to, but I'm going to also just make you a co-host so you have all the controls. Okay. And we're, we're technically scheduled till 6, 7.30, correct? Yeah. I don't, I mean, I don't mind going over if people are, you know, with me, but I'll try to be attentive to time. Okay. I know, last night actually ended up going really long. <laughs> it went till... And compost? Yeah. Compost, well, compost, compost grabbed them? That's yeah, great. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, no, it was good. And then, um, but then people started asking me other horticulture questions ah. about their vegetable gardens and their clay right. soil and their right. <laughs> different things like that. How to do a soil test and yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's like when someone finds out you know about plants you know at a dinner party or something and they're like oh right. <laughs> i know i know yeah i taught i taught science and uh walking down the hall uh, you know <laughs> another teacher would start coming down the hall and they go oh good a science teacher i just want to like dive under something <laughs> dive, you know <laughs> totally <laughs> 
They're like, I have this house plan that. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah. It's always the ID questions that get you. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah, it's about this big and you know, <laughs> leave a shape like this and you know, and you sort of get sucked in a little bit. Totally. You're like and it's a mistake. It is a mistake. <laughs> Do not try to ID a plant from somebody's description. I, I know. I've totally right? been there. Right? Yeah, yeah. I even had, I remember this one time this I was like drawing on the sidewalk with his finger to try and describe yeah. it. And I'm like, hmm, it's not, that's not helping. Just don't. And just, I know, right? And they're, they're describing, you know, when they meant to be describing a leaflet, you know, as if it's the leaf and you're thinking, you know, a leaf and it's really a compound leaf. It's just, oh, just don't go there. I know. Definitely been there. <laughs> yeah, I've had some wild situations with that. <laughs> yeah, you're both like keep going and get nowhere. Right. Oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. What was that? That looks like my mailbox. It is. It is. Well, we'll just get rid of that. But I don't know <laughs> why that popped up. Yeah, Charlie. Why would that pop up? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Who knows? Well, I have no embarrassing pictures on my, in the computer, none whatsoever, unless you consider little girls in the bathtub, you know. <laughs> They're deeply buried in there because the girls are pretty old now. They'd be horrified. <laughs> so I don't have to worry about weird things. Okay, just some emails. Yeah, just just emails. <laughs> that could be harmless emails. All right. So what do you think? Is it time to get started or we have twenty two. We have twenty two people, but we are at six thirty three. So and you usually wait till six thirty five. But we have some We have some comments already. Yeah. So somebody is saying, I'm here, but my computer is acting strange. Do you, do you have that one, Charlie? Uh, I'm, I, ha I, I don't, haven't worked on that. Um, no worries. Anything. Yeah, I don't think he can address that. Yeah. <clears throat> oh boy. Well, shall we get started? Yeah. Sure, I'm ready. Okay. Well, good evening, evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's presentation, which is entitled Native and Innovative in Invasive Plants, <laughs> Grassroots Activism and Trade Secrets of a Native Plant Gardener. And this is being presented by Carolyn Sears, also known as Carrie Sears. So good evening, my name is Suzanne Barkley and I'm the Executive Director of Cornell Cooperative Extension of Rockland. This program is funded by a grant from uh, Cornell's College of Agriculture and Life Science, known as CALS, and it's part of a series that we've entitled Sustainable Suburbia. Uh, we're offering a series of workshops addressing what we see as the three major environmental issues in Rockland right now, which are an overabundance of deer, rampant invasive plant growth, and a limited water supply. In Rockland, everybody knows about our burgeoning deer population. And even though a quarter of our county is actually protected parkland, deer can be found in suburban backyards as well as uh, village downtowns, and also in our parks and woodlands. And because they need to eat roughly eight to 12 pounds of vegetation a day, they are literally consuming the understory and significantly affecting our environment. Our drinking water supply is essentially limited to the rainfall which falls within our borders and then is captured in reservoirs or is absorbed into our uh, aquifer and wells. <clears throat> so we do have a limited water supply. 
but in January, the Rockland Water Task Force released their newly uh, created water conservation plan. And in there, there is a role for everyone to play, whether it's a business, a government, or a community, community member. Everyone has a role to play to understand the limits of our water supply and also how to conserve it. And then I mentioned our third issue, which is invasive plant species that have also established themselves around the county. Everyone is familiar with the Phragmites that have taken over the Pyramont Marsh. Uh, you've probably also seen Japanese knotweed all along our rail trails and you've seen Barberry up and down the Palisades Interstate Parkway. So later in the month, we'll be addressing the deer population, but tonight we're fortunate to focus on invasive species. And our speaker, Carrie Sears, a former teacher and an accomplished master gardener, serves on the Pound Ridge Conservation Board. She co-founded the Invasive Project in the town of Pound Ridge and will be discussing her work tonight as an activist. After Ms. Sears' presentation, uh, we'll open the floor for questions and we'll use the chat function, which you can, if you're not familiar with that, it's the white bubble labeled chat, which is found usually at the bottom of your computer screen or it might be at the top. So when you click on that, you'll see a space for which, uh, in which you can write your question. And Kristen Osman, who you see on the screen, is our court horticulture educator at uh, Extension, and she'll be um, managing the questions for us tonight. At the end, uh, we'll close with an online survey because we'd like to hear what you think of the presentation and uh, what you got out of it. So um, if somehow you're not able to participate in that online survey, not to worry, email us and we'll send you the link again. So without further ado, thank you again for joining us. And I'd like to now turn it over to Carrie Sears. Thank you, Suzanne. So good evening, everybody. Um, I wanna be talk talking um, in a very broad way about um, invasive plants. I wanna talk really about how to get a community to recognize the issue and uh, perhaps engage with the issue. So this is a project that uh, I took on starting in 2012 with uh, no staff and a uh, very limited budget. And so, um, and I hope there are some, I'm able to share some ideas with you about how you might go about doing this. So my first slide is uh, a, a bit of an inside joke with uh, Japanese stillgrass as being our motivating force here for some grassroots activism. But the other thing that I uh, hope to share with you too then are some tips from uh, my experience as a native plant gardener too, something that I came to a little uh, late in my gardening career. Uh, but first I wanna talk about um, the Invasives Project Pound Ridge and how it got started. So um, I live in Pound Ridge across the river from you, about 55 miles north of the city. And it's about a 23 square mile community with a population of about 5,000. Um, I, really, uh, I, I didn't really know what I was doing when I got started on this. I was with a friend sitting at Blind Charlie's having a cup of coffee. And I said to Marilyn Shapiro, I said, I've really had it with these invasives. I wanna do something. And she said, okay, we'll do it. Let's do it and let's do it the right way. So the first thing we did was work on a, a name for our project and a mission statement. And this is the mission statement with it we came up with to protect the natural beauty of Pound Ridge, preserve wildlife habitat, encourage the use of native plant species and limit the spread of invasive species. We worked on our name, okay, and we worked on forming partnerships with the Henry Morgenthau Preserve and the Pound Ridge Conservation Board. It helps that uh, Marilyn was 
uh, director of the Henry Morgenthau Preserve and I'm on the conservation board. I was on the conservation board at the time, I'm chair. And the other thing we did was join the Lower Hudson Prism, which I would encourage you to join the Lower Hudson Prism. It serves uh, Rockland County as well as Westchester County. And then we worked on creating an identity. We worked on um, publicity, getting the word out in all kinds of ways with uh, social media, the newspaper, Facebook, Instagram, all of that. And uh, we would do things over and over again, you know, get press releases before and after photos, uh, photos with faces, local people in the, in the article um, really works to get people's uh, attention. Let's see, um, some other kinds of things to, you know, some advice is you really do need to know your stuff you need to use good resources, attend conferences, and as I mentioned, join the local prism and prepare an elevator speech for people for why, why this is important. Uh, you do need to know that it is, there are some controversial elements when you're talking about invasive species. There are certainly some people that are say, just let it go, let nature run its course, which includes seeing what happens with uh, in invasive plants. Um, that is not my stance, okay? Uh, in other ways of getting, getting yourself out there are you know, plant displays. We did uh, uh, farmer's markets. We uh, did indoor displays, lectures, um, and use the partners uh, as a source of, of guest speakers, nat local naturalists, other master gardeners, and I've traded talks with people. Um, so those would become uh, very low cost to no cost kinds of things to get the word out and in the community. Yeah, we need, you, you have to kind of prepare for some things leading to others. We, uh, and expect the unexpected. So I, I had uh, two residents contact me. They said, we're going to take on Japanese knotweed. We're going to dig it up along our roadway. Um, and then they called me and said, we need help getting rid of the debris. And um, I had to enlist other people. And believe it or not, we filled this huge container um, dumpster full of Japanese knotweed. Um, and involved when my son heard what I was doing, he showed up with an ex excavator to help carry loads of Japanese knotweed and get, you know, to get rid of it. Um, some crazy ideas. We've done some other crazy things, like we actually uh, have used goats to cut, to eat the Japanese knotweed over and over and over again. Um, it was uh, an experimental and uh, kind of very charismatic. People love the goats, so that got a lot of attention. Uh, I have to tell you, I have not been pleased with the results. Uh, the, we were, the, the two women that uh, dug up the Japanese knotweed have, been, have had greater success than we did with goats eating knotweed three years in the same patch. Um, let's see. Where are we? Um, we've done some, some work parties, Japanese, uh, pulling Japanese st stilt grass uh, or covering it and weed whacking it um, are some of the approaches that we used. We also have done in the winter time, vine cutting. This is, do you see the oriental bittersweet, huge vines, uh, massive and uh, really gets a lot of attention when we do get rid of those. They're so unsightly and they do pull trees down. So we've done that too. Um, it's important, what I've learned is it's very important to aim for some balance, some both you know, give and take with the volunteers. They give you their time and you wanna give them something in return and uh, combine some work and play and balance the invasives message with information out about the natives. Um, it's a little bit like, uh, you know, cooking versus cleaning up the kitchen. 
to have some kind of balance in the activity helps a lot. So we've balanced the invasive project with the pollinator pathway and our requirements are to have an invasive project consultation, which I'm going to be talking about because that's the key activity for our invasives project. Um, we also in encourage people to add native plants to their property to manage the invasive plants and to reduce or eliminate entirely their use of pesticides using IPM instead and to spread the word, to tell other people. Now, the first person to uh, start the pollinator pathway, I wanna give her some credit, is Sarah Bergman in 2008 in Seattle, Washington. She created a pathway uh, uh, with the, along the roads, between the road and the sidewalk, that little tiny strip. Um, she uh, encouraged people to plant flowers that supported the pollinators and to connect to the parks in Seattle. Well, where we live in Pound Ridge, it's a little bit different because we have preserves and uh, uh, a lot of acreage, but the idea is that our yards will connect to those preserves and reduce fragmentation. Okay, so a little different twist on the pollinator pathway. I'll ask you later if you have the pollinator pathway in Rockland. It's pretty active in Westchester and also in Fairfield, Connecticut. Um, another way to sort of balance the, the work with some fun activities is to arrange some special visits. So my volunteers, uh, we arranged for a trip to see Carolyn Summers gardener, Garden, Flying Trillium. She, uh, Carolyn Summers is a, uh, a long, long, time um, native plant gardener and very inspirational. And in Pound Ridge, we have the Sarah Stein garden. Sarah Stein wrote the book Noah's Garden, which is about using native plants. And uh, it was purchased by James and Ellen Best, who lovingly take care of it and allow us to visit. So that was one of our kind of balancing activities to reward those volunteers. We've also arranged for native seed collecting expeditions in native plant gardens, and then demonstrations on how to clean and uh, willow out the, the shaft and separate uh, the seed itself and save it. And then um, to do winter sowing of those seeds. Here you see Barbara Gerson with a big stack of them. We also um, do outside events, like I said, to promote the people in the community to join the pollinator pathway. Here you see the red places on the map that are homeowners, properties, um, connecting, create, really creating the pathway. Okay. Um, in, let's see, it's very, the pollinator pathway is very popular. In 2019, we got almost 100 properties, no time flat with that. Um, let's see, I, you know, this is sort of a, a little, a good time to just sort of pause for a minute and, re, and insert something here to uh, encourage you to look at your local ordinances. Um, regarding native plants and um, thinking to think also about setting up a native plant rescue plan where if a property is going to be developed that you can have trained botanists go in and look for native plants and uh, save them from the bulldozers and move them someplace where they have a chance to grow. A little off topic but very related to you know it's the other side of the coin isn't it. So um, I want to talk now about consultations. The, uh, those other things that we do, the, the work parties, the vine cutting, um, and uh, then also balancing it with trips to different gardens and guest speakers and things like that, is a small part of what we do. A major part of the Invasives Project is doing consultations. And we do consultations for individuals, and we do them for groups of individuals living in a neighborhood. So that is what I wanna focus on. Um, this has been a very important part of our project. 
So for a consultation, the landowner requests it. They ask us to come to their property, walk their property with them and identify the natives and the invasives. We don't try to get rid of their invasive plants. That's their responsibility. But we will tell them what they have, which is the first step. So they make a request. And then I have a volunteer scheduler who is comfortable with spreadsheets and, and calendars and she an email and she sets a date with the homeowner and with two volunteers. We always go out as pairs. Usually one person is a little stronger with their plant ID and the second person is learning. Um, and it's a good combination. And we've, so we visit the homeowner. We end up almost always taking about two hours walking the property, identifying the natives and the invasives. The, my volunteers make a list and they send me the list. And then I enter it into a template that summarizes up the visit and includes some um, suggestions for getting rid of the more common invasives that we see see and then I email out copies both to the volunteer and to the homeowner. It's really quite simple, but it's been very effective. Um, to set something up like this, uh, you need to recruit some volunteers and somebody with those computer skills to be the scheduler. Then we need to provide sign-up opportunities for people at the tabling events or after a program um, they, where they can sign up or um, an email address where the, if they read something in the newspaper, they can send an email and sign up for uh, a consultation. Uh, we need to have a spreadsheet to keep track of it. We use a release form um, the volunteers sign a release form saying that they, if they trip and break a, a bone, they will not sue. They understand that accidents happen and they are on this property by choice. Um, and the property owner um, agrees not to sue us for, um, you know, the advice that we give them. They understand that we are volunteers. And uh, we also um, state that we cannot give medical advice and we cannot advise about eating mushrooms and um, a few other things like that. Um, I said we have a template that we summarize the visit and then we gather metrics. How many acres have we been, uh, or did we cover um, and what plants did we see? And my final advice is just to keep it simple. That is really what works about this is it's a pretty simple, elegant kind of program. Um, the challenges are to provide training for volunteers. Probably the best way is to have that one experienced volunteer partnered up with somebody who feels a little less confident. Um, Using the apps, iNaturalist and Seek have been amazing. We love them. They give people more confidence and courage and uh, they are so useful. And the other thing though, is to get across the message to my volunteer that the most important thing they can do is identify new invasive species, what we call early detection, rapid response because the well-established invasives like barberry, oriental bittersweet, mugwort, they're here to stay. And I wanna encourage people to reduce them, but the new invasive species that, have, that are not well-established in our area, those are the ones that we have the best opportunity to um, control and uh, prevent them from taking over unlike the things that were growing when we weren't paying attention. So a little, little bit of our metrics here, a little bit of, so here we, we started in, uh, the, we formed ourselves in the winter of 2012, 2013 and 2014, we started doing consultations and in a computer crash, I lost that data. And you, but you can see 2015, 16 requests, 20, uh, of, I'm sorry, did I say 16, 2015, 16 requests, 2016, 21, 
I don't know why we went down. And then all of a sudden we started to surge up 42, 53. This year with the uh, pandemic, um, it, we're not done with our requests, but they're definitely going to be down. Uh, the number of consults that we actually did, people tend to make the request and then when, when you go to schedule, different things happen or they don't respond. Um, so you could see our numbers drop quite a bit, okay, uh, from the request to the actual consultation. And then we keep track of acreage. Um, I mentioned earlier, we are about 2000 homes. We've reached out to 94. So, so far we've done about um, 4.5% of the town. Um, these acres are gonna grow a lot. This year, I have to say, this was quite unusual because one of these owners has 60 acres. So that really popped that data up, didn't it? Um, successes, these are really big successes. We identified hardy kiwi growing in our town and eradicated it. We identified sapphire berry and are in the process of eradicating that. Jupiter sage, these are the early detection rapid response species that I'm talking about. And these are being eradicated by uh, a team coming from the lower Hudson prism funded with DEC money. Um, they, when, when I said I have this growing in Poundridge, they were here and starting to deal with it. And, we, and we've, had, uh, we've identified possibly polonial and, and uh, Japanese hops. Uh, I think we've gotten rid of those too uh, mechanically. And we've had some false alarms with people thinking they've seen giant hogweed and I'll go out and check it. But I really don't mind following up on those false alarms because one of these days we might really have some and that's the time to take care of it. So I, I'm going to um, I'm going to pause here. I really want I know my volunteers are probably not listening and watching, but I want my volunteers to always know how grateful I am for them. It is this team of volunteers that are making it happen, and this is also a good time for me to kind of pause and give you a little time for some question and answers, and then I would move into. So what are some of the things that I like to share with homeowners when I do a consultation besides identifying the invasives and the natives? And before I actually, before I answer the question and answers, um, it occurred to me, I really didn't define invasives and that's, it's important to know what definition do we work with. So we work with uh, the federal definition of invasives which is that the plant is exotic to the region and causes harm either to the ecology or to human health or to the economy. Now where we live, it is usually to the ecology or possibly to human health. So hogweed, giant hogweed, which can cause such a severe dermatitis that you are hospitalized is a health hazard. Uh, the other invasives are affecting our preserves and our wildlands, our, ha our habitat. Uh, things affecting economy are usually agricultural or lumber, um, and we don't have that kind of uh, uh, we don't have that kind of economy in Poundridge. Um, the other thing about our definition is um, I use we use two lists of invasive species. One is the New York state list. And because we border Connecticut, we also use the Connecticut state list of invasive species. It's, so it's not, uh, it's not an arbitrary thing. You know, it's not a plant that we don't, that we dislike. So we call it invasive. Um, it, we, we follow those definitions. So now let me pause and see if there are any questions. Did I put everybody to sleep? <laughs> no, not at all. It's very interesting. <laughs> yeah, if anyone has any questions, um, please put them into the chat. Ooh. No questions. Oh, wait, here we have one. <laughs> um, I actually was thinking about this also. In physically removing Japanese knotweed, were you successful in getting all of the rhizomes that it was, that was successful in permanent elimination? The 
um, the, the, the two women that were digging up the Jap Japanese knotweed were relentless. I can't, I can't believe, I think they had, their thighs must have been like jackhammers. <laughs> yeah, um, you always hear of it being almost impossible to remove. That's right. That's right. But they did, uh, they did a, an incredible job. Um, incredible. Uh, I am, it's been two years, two, three years, and I am starting to see a few little patches coming back up. And that's the, you know, that is that rhizome and it persists and you really do have to keep at it. The goats, um, that was a three, three year ex experiment and it was really quite expensive. We had to pay for the, uh, we kind of contracted for the goats. Mm -hmm. um, and that Japanese knotweed looks like it was fertilized. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. that was very disappointing. Yeah. Um, someone's asking if you have a copy of the presentation on your website. But... I, I don't have a copy on the website, but I can try to do that. If you'll give me a little time. Yeah, but there is a lot of information on your website. Uh, there is. And yeah. at the at the end, um, I have the websites. There are actually two websites that I work with because I, I'm chair of the conservation board. So we have posted a lot of information about native plants on the conservation website, especially over the years. Okay. And then we have the invasives project website and that's pretty good. And then, and don't forget the lower Hudson prism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you have a question. Someone's asking how you recruited your volunteers. Uh, well, I was pretty well connected to the garden club for, uh, for a while. And um, so that was one way. And also uh, some master gardeners. Um, we, we border Connecticut and actually uh, I'm a Connecticut master gardener at the Bartlett Arboretum. And I was some of those uh, master gardeners live in Pound Ridge too. And then it was a little bit of word of mouth. We had uh, uh, the very first presentation that we did in the town. This is a very small town. We had 55 people show up, which was extraordinary, just extraordinary. Yeah. And we recruited people that way. Um, for, for us to have, you know, 15 people at a presentation is a, is a good sized crowd. So 55 was uh, mind blowing. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. Um, you have another question about the knotweed. Someone wanted to know if digging up the knotweed is the best way to get rid of it. And, oh yeah, I was curious about this too. When you disposed of it, um, how did, I saw it in that dumpster, but how did, right. you know, that, where did that go? Or That went to an incinerator. Okay. Thank heavens. Um, yes, disposal is a, a big issue. Um, back to the Japanese knotweed. Japanese knotweed is a huge challenge with that rhizome as, as we've been talking about. The rhizome can extend, not in our rocky soil, all right, but in, 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 good, in good favorable soil, it can extend eight feet deep, 40 feet horizontally. Wow. And I have seen it come up underneath, you know, from one side of the road to the other, I have seen it come under our roads. Um, so getting rid of that entire rhizome and every piece of the knotweed, every piece of the stem, any place there's a node, and a rhizome is an underground stem, so it's loaded with nodes. Any place there's a node, it, it can sprout, re-sprout. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it is a huge challenge. The, the good news is they are testing a biological control, and they're actually testing it in New York State. Um, I don't know the results on that. You know, it's uh, hopefully they'll be able to get, I think it's a little weevil, mm -hmm. if I remember it correctly, and hopefully the population will get established, survive the winter, and continue to take care of the knotweed. They've had success with purple loosestrife, that is a biological control, yeah, and also um, mile a minute. They're having some success with that. So here's hoping Japanese knotweed will have a biological and still grass is another very difficult one to control. Um, so there was just a comment that somebody 
is from Columbia County and they've been working on removing invasive species and replanting with natives. So I definitely think this is something that, you know, a lot of people, you know, as it showed in your numbers are paying attention to and there's more interest, you know, throughout the state and country. Um, yeah. And then someone was asking, or no, this is, someone's um, not sure if this is a, the exact question for this, but they're wondering about butter burdock in their garden. That's not an invasive that I know of. Do you? I'd, I would have to double check yeah. as if it's an invasive and I'd have to double check its life cycle to tell you the truth. I, I have a hunch it's a biennial. Yeah, me too. But I would want to check on that. Yeah. Um, and I think it has a, a pretty significant tap root. Yeah, I definitely know burdock to have a tap root. Right. So um, uh, uh, plants with a tap root are a challenge, like dandelion. dandelion yeah. You know. For sure. You have, yeah. Right. Uh, be if it is biennial, and maybe somebody can just do a quick check on the internet with that. If it's a biennial. The second, it, the first year, you know, you just have leaves. The second year, it puts up its flower stalk, and you get seeds. And after it goes to seed, it dies. So, if you're aware of that, one method would be to really control the seeding. Don't let it reseed. Yeah, don't let it go to flower. Exactly. Yeah. And and cut those seeds, put them into a a, a trash bag, and uh, you know, and let them go trash them. In, in Westchester, it's usually an incinerator. Yeah. Um, and then it, yeah. So that, I mean, that would be, and then your problem should be over if you keep up with the seeding. Yeah, for sure. And so I wanted to thank you for your fabulous presentation. And then um, someone's asking about a biocontrol for Phragmites. I am not sure yeah. what the status is on that. And then pokeweed. Pokeweed is not invasive. <laughs> right. right. Pokeweed is the native. Yeah. yeah. It's a native. Is it native. is aggressive, but it is it, a native. It is aggressive. So I have funny stories with pokeweed. And if if uh, if this if that's kind of the last the last one, I'll I can move on a little bit with it. Yeah, we'll but, have that be the last question for now. And you if you want to finish that up and then move on to Yeah, and I and I will get back to the pokeweed because it's in it's in my slides. Okay. So I, I thought I'd wrap up with a little bit uh, of this, you know, tips for my, my tips, some of my personal tips. I mean, this is some of like, what, what do I like to share when I want to visit? Besides identifying the, the native plants and the invasives, I like to, you know, talk to people about creating habitat and addressing climate change through their garden and um, simple landscaping tips if we have some time for, you know, if I have time during the visits. These are the two questions that I asked myself. I was not a native plant gardener until, you know, about 10 years ago. Um, and I've been gardening a long time. I gardened uh, with my mother. And, um, but, but now I ask myself this, I ask two questions. What value does this plant add to my property? And maybe it's aesthetic and maybe it's, uh, and, and maybe it's, in the wildlife that it supports, you know, supporting the uh, monarch caterpillars or other caterpillars, uh, pollinators, the hummingbirds, um, all kinds of things like that. But I want it to add value. And the second question that I've learned to ask myself is, do I want to be a source of biological pollution? And I, I have to tell you, when I first learned about invasive species, I had things growing on my property that were very well established and they they were part of the landscape and they you know did some kind of terrific stuff like uh winged euonymus which is a plant i can hardly bear to say the name anymore but when i first learned of this issue you know i liked my red winged euonymus in the fall i had it per it they were planted by the birds probably but they lined up perfectly with in the right places in the landscape and it took me a while to make the decision to get rid of it. And the big thing was realizing I didn't want to be a source for biological pollution. I didn't want seeds from my property to be going to other people's and especially to the preserves. So that was an important question for me. 
I grew up in a time when, you know, w water pollution and air pollution were hard to hot topics. And I finally got it when I thought about it as biological pollution. So when I walk somebody else's property and I'm going to give them some advice, these are some of the things in my head that I'm asking is, you know, what's the ecology around this property? Uh, what, what are the natural woodlands, for example, or are there wetlands or is there a meadow, something we don't have very much of? Um, and how can this property be connected to the, that natural ecology? And going back to the value of the plant, what does it add? And then does the owner understand how invasive plants are spread? Because they might say, well, I don't have any problem with it. So if I could get across that idea that it's going into other, going other places, that can be very important. So creating habitat, there are the basics of course are food, shelter, water, and places uh, for wildlife to raise their young. And then there are the questions about the specialists. Are generalist species, are, you know, are rabbits and raccoons and opossums and blue jays and uh, things like that who have very low needs? They're the generalists. They can survive quite uh, readily any place. And our specialists, though, have unique needs like the monarch caterpillar. So, um, okay. Then I look for, there's my pokeweed, if you, can you see a piece of it? So I, uh, I look for places that are creating habitat, like stone walls and logs, log piles, um, twig piles, the leaf litter itself. I encourage people to find places for, for that. And this might be a little easier in Pound Ridge. We're kind of a very naturalistic sort of community, as opposed to um, suburban mechan Mechanicsburg, where I grew up, which is sidewalks and lawns and things like that. Um, I encourage people to add layers to their property um, and a water feature, okay? By the layers, you want, I will encourage them to add more uh, of the herbaceous material and then shrubs and then trees. And it's also good to have evergreens as well as deciduous materials. Um, the water features are for the, for the birds. Um, and of course, reduce or eliminate pesticides. And the idea is to kind of create this buffet in your property. So there's food being generated in a bunch of other ways. And of course, the food supply can be boosted with bird feeders. So I, I'll come back to that pokeweed. There it is in the back of my house. Um, okay, I'm, I'm going, I'm flying through this stuff, but I will get the slideshow up for you. Then addressing climate change, the uh, plants take carbon dioxide out of the soil and they pump it, I mean, at, sorry, plants take the carbon dioxide out of the air and then they pump it into the soil through their roots, okay? They also put it into uh, the woody stems and they put it into the leaves, but the leaves drop and decompose annually, but they will put it back into the soil. Uh, you want to keep soil covered because soil actually holds carbon dioxide. And when you have it covered with a ground cover of plants, it keeps the carbon dioxide in the soil. And this is another reason why they uh, tell us now to avoid tilling the soil because that releases the carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. And we're trying to keep that greenhouse gas lower. Um, avoiding the synthetic herbicides, pesticides, and fertilizers will help. Raising the height of the mower, the lawn mower is also a climate um, reducing technique. And composting, I heard that uh, Kristen talked about composting just last night and leaving the leaves as a mulch, okay, or, um, also creates habitat and holds the carbon dioxide for a little while, okay. Um, so some, some very basic tips, okay, are to vary the plantings, have annuals and perennials, um, have the shrubs, trees, reduce 
the lawn. You've heard it before, I'm sure, because the lawn is a monoculture. And the varying heights will um, appeals to wildlife. For landscaping purposes, repetition gives unity, okay, if you repeat the plantings. And it also can create uh, a target for wildlife to find, okay, one plant in one, of one color is not necessarily going to be seen by a migrating uh, monarch or by migrating birds. So repetition helps to create a little target. And then seasonal plantings add uh, interest and food throughout the seasons, right? And of course, native plants over exotics. Um, and I will just say, I heard problems about the deer. I live with deer. Uh, it is a problem. And on the uh, Conservation Board website, we have good lists of native plants that are deer resistant. It does limit what you can grow, but there are possibilities. Now, back to my pokeweed. Here you see my pokeweed over here in behind the, the table and chairs. So you can, if you create a sense of order, you can get by with a lot, okay? Paths, if you threw a, a meadow or a part of the yard that you let go a little wild, if you have a path, it creates that sense of order and the path can be just mowed lawn, okay? Telling people, walk this way. Um, stone walls and picket fences add a sense of order. Entrances and arbors, destinations and focal points um, create that sense of order too. Edging and mulch and raised beds and features like bird baths and sundials. So here in my back patio, I have my table and chairs and behind it is weedy old pokeweed. Okay, it's, and um, I had gardeners coming to my gardener walking through saying, and admiring this exotic plant, what is that? They were just astounded by this beautiful plant what is it? And it is pokeweed, uh, which has kind of an interesting draping flower and then it turns into those beautiful berries. But it is difficult to, once you have pokeweed growing in a spot, it is hard to get rid of it. Um, I don't, <laughs> I've done a lot of things. I don't advocate necessarily getting the pokeweed starting along the house. It eventually grew all along the back of my house and now I am negotiating, finding it, uh, to, letting it grow in other places. Um, I struggled to raise pokeweed by seed. Um, my stories with pokeweed. It has a very interesting seed. It's like a little button, and when you when you crush it, it breaks into multiple seeds growing around in a little circle. It's really quite amazing. But grow, try as I might, I could not get those seeds to germinate. The birds, on the other hand, have taken my pokeweed seeds and spread it throughout the property. It's popping up all over. Um, and so I'm choosing to let it grow in certain places. It is a good source of food for wildlife. Um, not the best thing to have close to your house. It can stain. It gets very, very big, um, but it, it's been fun, to actually. Um, and I'm encouraging it like along the roadside and things like that in our wild Westchester uh, natural kind of s escaping places. So just a, a few more things. I think I have three slides left. Um, these are landscape tips, that repetition, that uh, it makes it look like it's not a mistake. It pulls it together. And planting a mass. Okay, so you don't have one um, Black Eyed Susan, but five Black Eyed Susans. It stands out for people and it stands out for the uh, butterflies. Uh, planting, if you choose to plant in pairs, it draws the eye to the middle of that, the pair. So if you think about pillars at the end of a driveway, they tell you to drive between those pillars. If you plant two plants in pairs, it tells you to go through, to look through the middle. That's a good technique. It frames it. It can also work against you. So you just want to decide how you're doing it. 
odd numbers are much more naturalistic. That's what nature does in threes, fives, things like that. So if you want a more natural look, the odd numbers help, okay? Straight lines give you a more formal look. And you could do, you could take nat native plants, put them in straight lines, and you get that formal look. Curves, okay, are much more naturalistic. Even spacing gives you that formal look. In nature, it's uneven. So you can use these tricks if you want a formal garden, you can use native plants planted in a formal way, okay? And if, but if you want the naturalistic look, you know, you go, you go for the other stuff. Um, a focal point can be a, a, a yellow garden seat or cushion further away. Uh, yellows pop up, they, pop, they draw the, the, the landscape that's further away, they draw it closer to you. Blue makes it recede away. So, you know, quick, quick kinds of things. Two more slides, I promise. So this is mom, okay? And my mother, my mother had the ability of looking at a, a patch of clover and spotting four-leaf clovers. I have books with pressed four-leaf clovers in them by the hundreds. She, if she were talking with you and there were clovers nearby, she would lean down and she could pick out a four-leaf clover. We would drive along the highway, not finding four-leaf clovers, but she would tell my father, stop. And we would go tromping off into the field. She had spotted some kind of flower out there in the distance. She was really quite amazing. I tell you that because my father, on the other hand, if he saw three leaves, he called it poison ivy. It didn't matter if it was clover or anything else. Some people are just, they are plant blind, okay? Returning to invasives for a minute, some people are, when they see it, they're just gonna say, oh, look at that pretty little yellow flower. When I see this one, I cringe. This is taking over the wet places along our highways, uh, lesser celandine or ficaria ranunculus. Uh, it's a, it is amazing how this spread uh, spreads. What I just want to say is this, in, this in, if you're interested in, in getting people to focus on invasive species, you have to be, be humble. I didn't, I'm telling you, I wasn't aware of it as a, uh, aware of it as a problem. It keeps me humble. I've planted plants that are invasive. I'm working hard to get rid of them. Um, so first it comes by awareness. Then there's when they start to see all that Japanese barberry and winged euonymus and phragmites, then there's alarm and then comes action. So we have to be patient sometimes. So here's the Eastern box turtle that visits my property every once in a while. And these are some of the things I try to remind myself it is one step at a time. Boundaries, okay, my, the, the uh, Invasives Project Pound Ridge, we only visit properties in Pound Ridge. You have to be realistic, you have to know your goal, stay humble, stay optimistic, and just keep at it. That's my box turtle. And here is an email and some websites. I forgot to put the Lower Hudson Prism on that slide. And I really went fast through that, but I did want to give a few minutes for question and answers. I'll give you more time in a few minutes. I'm, I'm here, I'm home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was wonderful. Thank you. It was fast. It was a lot. <laughs> no, it was wonderful. So you do have quite a few questions. I think, um, uh, Oh, I think this is where we left off. Someone was asking, even though it's not invasive, it is a native, they're wondering how you work with poison ivy. Poison ivy. Yeah, I'm kind of fortunate. I don't, I, I'm not so allergic to poison ivy, um, which helps. Um, so the first, you know, the first thing is you need to be able to identify it, and you need to be able to identify it in all forms in the winter time with the leaves, without the leaves, as a vine, as a ground cover, young, juvenile, those hairy stems that'll grow right up the tree. Um, I, I'm not an advocate of herbicides. 
-hmm. But I do think this is a, a, a case, a, a time and a situation. If the poison ivy is growing in your back 40 and you don't go there, it has high wildlife value. It does. On the other hand, if it's growing in your garden and you're going to come up against it, um, I, uh, I use a, um, a cut and paint method. So right where you cut the stem, you put a little bit of Roundup on there and it will suck into the root and, you know, and, and uh, take care of the poison ivy. Um, I can, if it's really not much at all, um, there's kind of that uh, uh, doggy bag trick where you take a plastic bag, you put it on your hand, you grab the poison ivy, and then you invert the bag over the poison ivy and, you know, pull and then dispose of it that way. Uh, but some people, that might be a little too close. Yeah. I have a sister who's extremely sensitive. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, and then Donna D'Souza, who's one of our master gardeners, she looked up burdock and it is a biennial. Biennial. Yeah. So thank you. So and um, Suzanne was wondering, in case people aren't familiar with Lower Hudson Prism, if you can just explain a little bit more about it. Good question. Thank you. So the Lower Hudson Prism, you always have to be careful how you say that. The, it stands, the PRISM part stands for Partners in Regional Invasive Species Management. Um, all of New York State has been divided into different regions called PRISMs, mm -hmm. and we happen to be in the Lower Hudson, which extends up both sides of the Hudson for several counties, mm -hmm. okay, including Westchester and Rockland and going up um, both sides. Um, it is state funded um, to join, to, you can attend their meetings. There's, uh, they meet a couple times a year right now, of course, online. Um, there's no membership fee um, to become a partner. They just expect you to, they ask you to commit to attending uh, a certain percentage of meetings during a year. At the meetings, they always try to have a, an educational component. I learn a lot. Um, I learn, a, uh, that's where I become aware of the early detection rapid response and their, where it is in, in our area. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, and they also are a source of funding, okay? And certainly support in other ways. So I encourage anybody to join the Lower Hudson Prism. You, you are welcome as an individual or as a member of an organization. It's nice yeah. to have your organization represented there. Yeah, we are, we are a member, the CCE, Cornell Cooperative yeah. Extension is a member. Yes. Mm -hmm. Did that help with the- Yeah, that was great. They, they, they move their meetings around so that uh, because it's this long, narrow region, yeah. So, well, they try to hold them in different places within that region so that uh, the same people are not always inconvenienced or favored by the location. Yeah. That's kind of fun, too. Yeah, it is fun. Yeah. Um, so I, if there, I don't believe there are any other questions. Well, then that's yeah. pretty good. <laughs> that's it. That was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Karen, right. uh, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, we had a number of very skilled master gardeners in the audience, and I'm uh, quite sure they learned something new. So thank you for your presentation. Thank you, Suzanne. And I also enjoyed the rubric you shared with us, the awareness, alarm, and action. <laughs> I'm sure we can apply that to all sorts of different issues. So That's that was, right. Uh, it's right. It, Exactly, right? Ignorance is bliss, right? And then, yeah, I mean, I can, I can really think about when I, when I woke up to the invasive species, I was hearing about it, but it wasn't really until one, one spring when I saw the Japanese barberry in the woods yeah. and, and saw how extensive it was, that, that that one was really a wake up call for me personally. Um, yeah. And as I said, it makes my own, my own evolution as a gardener, 
Um, and even as a, I, I studied biology in undergraduate school and there wasn't talk about invasive species. We didn't really even focus on where something came from. It wasn't really part, I mean, I took uh, some uh, botany classes, wildflowers, and tree identification and stuff like that. And uh, we focused on the identification and classification, but never really talked very much about origins. Mm -hmm. And certainly we weren't talking about population, population explosions and changing habitats and environments and all of that it just wasn't part of the we talked about succession natural succession mm -hmm. and now you disturb you disturb an area around here there is no natural succession yeah right that but that's i studied natural succession mm. you know it's kind of it's interesting so so uh i had to become aware and and i that and i went through that you know, oh, my little rubric. So. Yeah. <laughs> so well, thank um, you for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you. And I think um, when we close out, we'll have a link to our evaluation. So if people can spend a moment and complete it online. But if you can't, we can uh, email it to you. Okay. So again, I want to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, we will be having another um, presentation in the Sustainable Suburbia series, which will be on deer management or lack thereof. Right. That's a tough one. Yes. It is. Uh, everyone, I put the link in the chat window if you want to copy it or click on it now. It should pop up, but in case it doesn't, it's there too. Thank you, Charlie. We also had a comment from one of our master gardeners who um, found black swallowwort with milkweed, oh. which is like a terrible, you know, invasive uh, milkweed relative with tiny oh, yes. monarch caterpillars on it that all die. So oh. she thinks that's one that's really important for people to identify and help educate the public and eradicate it. It is important. Yeah. And, and it's a challenge. It has a, it's a real challenge. It has a, a little crown and at yeah. that little crown, you'll, the, you can, it's full of nodes that will yeah. germinate, uh, sprout, sorry, sprout new plants. And then of course, if you've seen it growing, uh, it grows almost like a vine, a crawling vine on the ground. It's not, it doesn't go up the trees, but on the ground. And it will be, oh, six, seven feet long by the end of the summer. Yeah. And if you hold it up, dangling off of it are clusters of pods, string, like string bean pods, sleeks. And then each one of those is filled with seeds. When it pops open, that will be spread by the Yeah, the I've wind. seen it quite a bit in the, just on the hiking trails around here. Yes. In uh, up, upstate New York, it covers acres, acres. Yeah, so it, it's a very, yeah, we have yeah. a little bit of it in Pound Ridge. It catches along the sides of the roads, along the stone wall fences, you know, the seeds blow and they, they get caught there. So that's where I see it, but it will move, of course. Yeah. Um, somebody was saying a comment that creating wildlife habitat is not good for food growers, but, um, I would say that fencing for that would be my solution for food growing is that you know if you want to have a balance of having wildlife habit you know a beneficial wildlife yes. habitat but then you know if you're growing food which is fantastic just you know I think fencing is probably the solution what would you say Carrie? I would uh, definitely I mean that's the only way I can have a vegetable garden yeah. down bridge that's the way it's been for years um, the it, it, to, to comp to have a balance, to ha be able to fence in some of the property and then have hedgerows and things like that because the birds are gonna provide a lot of assistance in, in pest control. Yeah. So, uh, the deer will wall up a garden. A groundhog I think is worse. The groundhogs are deer. I think they are worse. Yeah. So when you fence that garden, if you haven't done it already, you, you have to fence under the ground yeah. a little bit, okay? We made the mistake. We, 
when we installed the vegetable garden, we just brought the fence to the ground. And yeah. I've had groundhogs have a heyday yeah. in, in the garden. I know. Uh, they... <laughs> yeah, yeah that, I had some sweet peas that I didn't have fenced in. And yeah, that was a big treat for them this spring. <laughs> <laughs> Some heirloom sweet pea. <laughs> yeah. But a combination, because there's a lot of support from the uh, the, the birds and the, the insects that will be supported too by natural by native plants. Yeah. The, benef the beneficials. There's a yeah. lot of support in there. Yeah, definitely. Um someone has a question about do you educate about play clean go, which advocates clearing boots, et cetera, when visiting different sites to stop spreading seeds. Oh, that's a wonderful yeah, that program. Is a really good, yeah. It's a good question and it's a wonderful program. And I did learn about it through the Lower Hudson Prism. Yeah. And uh, so um, the, the question was pretty well watered, this the, worded, this play clean go campaign is a little bit like the Smokey the Bear campaign, you know, don't, and uh, anti-littering campaigns. They're trying <laughs> to get this slogan across, play, clean, go. Yeah. And they're trying to get it at boat launches and they're trying to get it at trailheads mm -hmm. so that we learn to clean our boots and clean off our boats and our trailers um, so we don't spread invasives. It really is a major way that invasives are spread. Yeah. I'm trying, as head of the conservation board, I'm trying to bring it to our trailheads in Pound Ridge, the boot scrapes yeah. is, is what they are. So yeah, that was that's a great thing, great program. Yeah. Whoever brought that up, thanks. Um, Suzanne was wondering if you, ever deal with aquatics, aquatic invasives? I personally don't. The Lower Hudson Prism does. I just don't have the, the background in it. Mm -hmm. I know in our area, there have been some associations, lake associations, homeowners, uh, that have professionally been dealing with it. Um, there are DEC regulations that you have to be aware of if your water has an outlet you are restricted you, um, by what you can do because it can mm -hmm. obviously go downstream. Yeah. Uh, but no, I, I don't have much experience with the aquatics yeah. myself. So there are no more, are there any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Carrie. That was wonderful. Well, thank you. Very thank inspiring. You. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Suzanne. Well, thank you. And thank you, Charlie, for your help. Yeah. And everybody <laughs> else for coming. <laughs> yeah, thank you all for attending, and I hope you learned a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>